a very a very good evening to one and all presenting uh, here. Um, I am Abhishek Baghela. I'm working as a product manager in genomics uh, portfolio at Premas Life Sciences. And on behalf of Premas Life Sciences and the Foundation for Medical Research, I welcome you all for this virtual workshop. Today, to begin with, we have Dr. Kaizad Nilgiriwala with us. He's a tuberculosis research officer at the Foundation for Medical Research in Mumbai. The FMR has a seminal contribution towards fight against tuberculosis. And to further brief us about the uh, FMR and about the uh, and, and to have introductory remarks, I request Dr. Kaiza to please take over. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek. So, hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome all the participants of this online workshop on behalf of uh, the Foundation for Medical Research, FMR. I am, as, a, as a Dr. Abhishek uh, introduced me, I'm uh, Dr. Kaiza Nilgiriwala from uh, FMR, and I have been involved in research on the genomics of uh, drug resistant tuberculosis since over seven years now, and have also been working on the genomics of SARS CoV 2 since last two years in this pandemic. We are also involved in capacity building and training of the whole genome sequencing TB labs in India since last uh, four years now. It is no more a secret that the DNA or the deoxyribose nucleic acid is the master molecule in a cell that provides essentials for all the cellular processes. And understanding the DNA is likely, uh, I mean, it's, it's like understanding the roots, which gives a comprehensive picture towards deciphering the hidden messages that. Uh, nature has stored deep within. So with the advancements in uh, DNA sequencing technologies, man has reached a stage where no stone can be left unturned. Only if we can tap on these uh, sequencing technologies to seek the right answers for the right and timely questions. This workshop has been uh, designed for an audience that is uh, composed of uh, researchers, clinicians, students, and uh, professionals, either directly dealing with tuberculosis or COVID research or diagnosis, and or, or uh, are inter who are interested in uh, learning the nuances of uh, using NGS or next generation sequencing for these diseases. Our director, uh, Dr. Nergias Mistry, is unable to be present today uh, since she has to attend an urgent meeting. Uh, but she has asked me to welcome you uh, all to this workshop on her behalf. Uh, she, and she has recorded a short video with her introductory remarks, uh, which I'm going to share with you in a while. I again welcome you all uh, to this workshop, where we all eagerly await to learn from the highly experienced national and international experts and from each other. So thank you and a warm welcome. So if you can just play the video. A good day to you, whichever part of the globe you happen to be in. The Foundation for Medical Research Mumbai, along with Premas Life Sciences, is happy to host this webinar over the next two days to inform, orientate, and sensitize students, researchers, and clinician communities on the principles, use, and applications of the technology of whole genome sequencing as evinced in the two critical fields of tuberculosis and COVID-19. While sequencing technologies have made inroads in TB research and diagnostic applications in India since around 2015, the first papers being published by NIRT Chennai and FMR almost at the same time, the progress, especially at the absorption level into the public health system, has been definitely slow. In contrast, sequencing-based surveillance in COVID has taken off rapidly since 2020, with the rapid inclusions of over 43 laboratories under INSECOG on a national basis. The objectives there have been the detection of viral variants. And while the epidemiological basis of sampling has been a bit weak, the overall trends have been successfully captured. Yet, India's contribution to the GISAID risk repository remains at just 1.75%, 1 
the sample sequenced in India are about 0.17 million compared to the world tally of 9.5 million. But the technology undoubtedly has the system's blessings, even to the point of utilizing sequencing for environmental surveillance. And this is particularly apt now as the cases become lower and lower. Not so in tuberculosis. The utility of whole genome sequencing while being established in research circles is still debated and wanders between cataloging of drug specific mutations on one hand and transmission epidemiology on the other hand. This is largely because of two reasons. One is that the competencies of transmission epidemiology in the country are at best rudimentary and still developing. And secondly, the validity of detected mutations with respect to disease outcomes has not been completely established uh, by the mutation catalogs that are available today. However, the time for whole genome sequencing has now come in several fields. And it is important that its familiarization to endline users is initiated. This brings the technology closer to the patient. I am thankful to Dr. Bagela for initiating this familiarization through this event centered around World TB Day, that is 24th March. His team too has spared no effort in getting this event underway. And a special mention needs to be made of Dr. Dibjani Saha from Premas. Overall, I would like to acknowledge the significant support of Illumina and Premas Life Sciences for sculpting this event. The familiarization of, to this technology has been strengthened immensely by the participation of several national and international experts who will share their experience and insights of this technology and motivate the thinkers in the audience to pursue their own lines of inquiry and acceptance of this technology. I thank them all for their ready willingness to share and convey. Whether WGS is the magic wand that we all need for TB or COVID control is very hard to say, but its efficient and innovative application may provide timely and new knowledge that may allow us to treat our patients better, hopefully more equitably, and offset global threats of disease spread in a timely manner. This is the hope with which we begin our program today. With over 600 registrations, there may be many who will be able to swish their magic wands. Thank you for being here and trust that together you will make it a successful event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaizad, and uh, our, our sincere gratitude towards uh, uh, a very nice video message by Dr. Mistri. Now, moving ahead, we have with us Dr. Devjani Saha. She has uh, she's she's a PhD from prestigious IISC Bangalore, and she has been driving and building from our life sciences marketing portfolio and uh, for over a decade now. And she's currently a, a assistant general manager in marketing. So over to you, Dev. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much uh, to all the attendees for, uh, you know, being a part of this very, very important session and something that's very relevant today. A lot of people call COVID-19 and MTB uh, like a syndemic because, you know, much before COVID-19 became a global pandemic, India was dealing with another and much older epidemic, which was basically MTB, which has affected millions of Indians over the years and killed many more. Um, in fact, India, I think, harbors a quarter of the world, uh, you know, TB patients. And of course, no country in the world has a higher uh, TB burden than India. So India today, after the pandemic or after these couple of years of intense uh, struggle or tussle with uh, COVID-19 is much better placed to counter and uh, tackle uh, you know, uh, such scourges uh, as COVID-19 or any other pathogenic disease. Uh, in fact, MTB being a multifaceted challenge, uh, you know, uh, the government has, current government has set a deadline of eliminating uh, MTB by 2025, which is kind of a little far-fetched, but this deadline at least has led to a number of uh, innovations. 
you know, which can potentially help us to overcome the various challenges associated with the disease. Uh, the public health ecosystem that has been, you know, that has taken into account infrastructural, economic, or maybe even socio-political approaches, you know, by the world's leading forces can actually be repurposed to overcome the uh, TB challenge also, as Dr. Misty pointed out. And uh, one of the biggest models that India can take from the COVID-19 pandemic is to address the TB testing roadblocks, right? And, you know, uh, despite the hurdles, et cetera, the key pieces of the necessary data infrastructure for mass TB surveillance and management can be extracted from the COVID model and can be utilized for, you know, collecting data at scale through labs, public and local health agencies. And once that is deployed, the other giant problem uh, that is basically deploying drugs to treat the patients can be done through effective testing uh, so that you can actually counter challenges like, you know, multi-drug resistance or XDR uh, TB, which are, you know, some of the major uh, challenges, right? In that spirit, actually, we thought that next generation sequencing being such a uh, important technology and which is becoming increasingly relevant and we've so seen its relevance through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic would be something which would be very uh, relevant to discuss. And, uh, you know, in order to democratize this technology, it's important that information or skill be made available uh, to everyone, right? So, you know, a beginning has to be made somewhere and beginnings have been made but I think it'd be nice to have a forum where people actually can discuss freely as to whether or not, uh, you know, in low, I mean, in low and uh, middle income countries like India, something as advanced as ne next generation sequencing can be deployed to understand A, the disease better, and secondly, to manage it better, third, to maybe, you know, like to, to create a prevent, uh, treat, you know, build cycle, right? And, uh, so we have a very exciting three days lined up, uh, you know, for you. The first day, of course, focuses more on the general overview of next generation sequencing. So we have Dr. Raj Shekhar Chatterjee and Dr. Kara Lim uh, focusing on uh, air chemistry, uh, Illumina chemistry of, uh, you know, how next generation sequencing happens and what are the essentials, what are the infrastructure required for a lab to carry about, uh, you know, NGS-based uh, uh, experiments. And Kara would be focusing more on the use of uh, next generation sequencing for infectious diseases, right? Uh, and applied genomics as an application. Uh, on, our, on the second day, uh, which is uh, 24th March, which is also a World TB Day, we have a bevy of, uh, you know, star speakers who will be focusing on uh, tuberculosis, uh, you know, epidemiology, um, you know, finding out MTV lineages, NGS and detection of MDR and XDR tuberculosis. So we have uh, Dr. Meeta Joshi from uh, Sir JJ Hospital, who's the head and department, uh, I mean, head of the Department of Microbiology. Dr. Grace Smith, who's the director of National Reference Mycobacteriology Services in uh, the UK Health Security Agency. Dr. Sebastian, uh, who is basically from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And we, uh, and then we have a panel discussion, which um, also includes Dr. Camilla Rodriguez, who's kind of um, been at the forefront of the entire TB effort in India. And um, in, on the third day, we have uh, you know, a um, specialized focus on COVID-19, which of course we're currently battling. So we have a presentation by uh, Shivaji, who is basically going to be outlining the Illumina COVID uh, workflow. Then we have uh, Dr. Sridhar from IGIB, uh, essentially uh, giving an insight on the genomic surveillance uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 in India through uh, the use of next generation sequencing. Um, then we have Dr. Kaisar, who will basically uh, give the concluding remarks, uh, followed by a vote of thanks. So uh, we really look forward to an exciting three days of intense discussions. And essentially, you know, uh, at the end of it, you know, I hope we, each one of us takes back something that can help us to counter this, these challenges. And, uh, you know, uh, and of course, we'll, we'll be in touch with uh, each one of you for the implementation uh, if required. 
of this um, amazing technology. Um, just one line about Pramas Life Sciences, it's been involved in reaching cutting edge technologies to all the research and diagnostic labs over the past 15 years. And uh, you know we're very happy to collaborate with FMR uh, and Illumina for this amazing workshop. Thank you very much. And over to you, Abhishek, uh, to introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Devjani. So we have with us Dr. Raj Shekhar Chatterjee. He's the, uh, he's the head application support at Pramas Life Sciences. And uh, he's, he's done his PhD from IGIP in molecular genetics. And he has a huge amount of experience as a postdoctoral fellow and worked at multiple places in US. And uh, at Pramas Life Sciences also, he's been uh, heading this particular division application support. At the same time, he's also helping us out in various pre-sales and marketing uh, events as well. So uh, over to you, Dr. Raj. Thanks a lot, Abhishek, for the introduction. And thanks a lot to everyone for making up the time. I know it's late evening for uh, many of you. Uh, you are attending the session right after getting out from your job or duty, whatever you're doing, but thanks a lot. So it's always, uh, I think, a pleasure giving the first session discussing the first session and uh, as always like before we uh, deeply dive deeply into the infectious disease covid mtb uh, we will try to learn a bit about the technology that we will be using here for ngs illumina uh, what it is what exactly the chemistry is the technologies and what all solutions we have in the form of instrumentation that we can use to address this so i'll be sharing my slides Uh, I hope you can see the slides. Abhishek, can you once confirm that the slide yes. is visible? Uh, yes, Raj. Okay, great. Yes, so the first session will be on the basic of NGS. So we will be discussing about Illumina chemistry, workflow and instrumentation. But before that, like why exactly labs use next generation sequencing? And so before that, what is next generation sequencing? So next generation sequencing was a term which was coined in around 2004, before which we were doing Sanger sequencing. So next generation sequencing was the next generation of that sequencing, which actually technically is high throughput sequencing. Okay. So the two major reasons why any lab will do NGS is to get qualitative information and quantitative information. So what are the qualitative information that we can get by doing sequencing? One is we will learn about the mutations or changes from the standard reference that are present. So this comes in form of incessant deletion, duplication, inversion, and definitely uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms and mutations. So vastly used in cancer or any other heritable disorders, including asthma, diabetes, and all. The second is pairwise difference. Like what is it that makes one particular person or one particular group different from other in genetic makeup? For example, let's say two friends, they have been in the same environment throughout the life. One person, if he smokes a cigar, he gets an asthmatic attack, the other person doesn't. Okay. So if environment and everything is fine, there has to be some changes in the genes, which are uh, making a person susceptible to a disease or resistant to a disease, right? So that is the pairwise difference, case control study or something that can be studied using the genome sequencing. The third and most important, uh, and one of the most important part of qualitative information that can be uh, gained from NGS validation. So we have all heard about genetic modified crops and all, and we have heard about Pomato and our scientists trying to create disease resistance crop, which gives uh, a good yield also, right? So there are genetic modifications. So you take the genes, which is inferring a crop resistance to a particular kind of disease or drought, and then you are putting it in a highly fruitful or a plant, which is giving a good amount of yield. And then you take the seeds and you validate that whether the desired mutation or the desired modification has gone into the seed. So that is validation study. Now coming to the quantitative information, the quantitative information that can be gained by using NGS are like, uh, like five or six different kinds. One is copy number variation, which is very important in reproductive health and genetic engineering. 
one simple example i gave here is like elephant being a very big mammal okay they all start with single cell but the number of division in an elephant is much more than in humans or a rat but humans are least susceptible to getting cancer the reason is they have multiple copies in fact 10 copies of p53 which prevents uh, cancer which is known to have a preventive role while humans have only one copy so this is about species difference but in the same species also between two human population there could be copy number variations on genes so that is one thing which is important to study then definitely gene expression how your rna expresses uh, for example in host pathogen interaction in drug responses the drugs work better in one person not in other could be due to gene expression gene regulation so we know small rnas they bind to mrna and can regulate their function so small rna micro rna kind of studies those are done using ngs then there are protein dna interaction epigenetics and metagenomics so metagenomics is also a very vastly looked after domain where uh, people can check the uh, micro population in the gut to see what is the difference between the gut microbiome of one person versus the other person you can check uh, you can check soil samples you can take up soils you can find what all bacteria are present in fact there are companies in the west who do a soil soil metagenomics analysis and can tell you like which particular kind of soil or which particular kind of land is good for which particular kind of crops so these kind of studies have also been done so these are all the quantitative information that you can gain out of nature genome sequencing okay now illumina covid sick assay that is the assay which has been uh, used for the past two years and uh, my dear friend from illumina kara will be touching uh, a bit on it so here the same nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab which is collected for uh, the real time pcr test is used rna is extracted and then uh, your libraries are made and run on an illumina next generation sequencing system so actually up to 3072 samples can be run at a single time and analyzed using our dragon analysis or dragon analysis pipeline so all this process takes around 2 days not more than that and you can actually get data of around 3072 samples out of it this has been widely and vastly used throughout the world not to mention india over 90% 90 to 95% of the covid samples which have been sequenced using the illumina covid seq assay so this is one of the examples where actually for surveillance purpose for knowing which variant is present ngs has truly helped the whole world okay so now coming to the sequencing workflow so there are actually four major steps of uh, an NGS sequencing workflow. It starts from sample preparation, whereby you collect your blood or tissues, biopsies, soil, anything from which you want to extract your DNA or RNA to prepare libraries. And then you extract your uh, nucleic acid. If it is DNA, you can straightforward take it for library preparation. If it is RNA, you convert it to a double standard cDNA, and then you uh, carry it forward for library preparation. So library preparation is a process we're using reagents so illumina has its own library preparation kit what you do is you actually cut or you fragment your dna and then you tag it with adapters so in the next slide i will show you how an adapter looks like but tagging with an adapter and making the library is important for sequencing so the third step is sequencing whereby your libraries are put into a, a sequencing kit a flow cell is there where your bridge amplification and sequencing happens it goes to uh, your uh, sequencer and then your insert your site of interest is sequenced and then the last and the most important step is analysis there are multiple analysis modules which are uh, present with illumina as well as various third party analysis uh, modules which are present by which you can finally analyze your data okay so these are the four basic steps of the workflow uh, this is how a library looks like after uh, preparing as i was telling you so the major aim of the library preparation kit is to finally get your library, which looks like this. So if you see in the five prime end, and this is the three prime end, there are P5 and P7 region of the adapters. These are the regions which help bind the library to the flow cell where your sequencing will happen. Then this black portions are indexes. Indexes are barcodes, which help you pool multiple number of samples in a single run. And then once your analysis is getting done, all your uh, particular data is segregated based on these barcodes or indexes. 
And then the third part is read one and read two specific primers. This is where your sequencing primer will bind and then read through the DNA insert for which you will finally get the data. Okay. Uh, I'm going to run a five minute short movie, which will take you through the complete process. Then I will briefly discuss it. Sample preparation begins with extracted and purified DNA. The first step in Nextera sample preparation is tagmentation. During tagmentation, transposomes simultaneously fragment and tag the input DNA with adapters. Once the adapters have been ligated, reduce cycle amplification adds additional motifs, such as the sequencing primer binding sites, indices, and regions that are complementary to the flow cell oligos. Clustering is a process wherein each fragment molecule is isothermally amplified. The flow cell is a glass slide with lanes. Each lane is a channel coated with a lawn composed of two types of oligos. Hybridization is enabled by the first of the two types of oligos on the surface. This oligo is complementary to the adapter region on one of the fragment strands. A polymerase creates a complement of the hybridized fragment. The double-stranded molecule is denatured and the original template is washed away. The strands are clonally amplified through bridge amplification. In this process, the strand folds over and the adapter region hybridizes to the second type of oligo on the flow cell. Polymerases generate the complementary strand, forming a double-stranded bridge. This bridge is denatured, resulting in two single-stranded copies of the molecule that are tethered to the flow cell. The process is then repeated over and over and occurs simultaneously for millions of clusters, resulting in clonal amplification of all the fragments. After bridge amplification, the reverse strands are cleaved and washed off, leaving only the forward strands. The three prime ends are blocked to prevent unwanted priming. Sequencing begins with the extension of the first sequencing primer to produce the first read. With each cycle, four fluorescently tagged nucleotides compete for addition to the growing chain. Only one is incorporated based on the sequence of the template. After the addition of each nucleotide, the clusters are excited by a light source and a characteristic fluorescent signal is emitted. This proprietary process is called sequencing by synthesis. The number of cycles determines the length of the read. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, determine the base call. For a given cluster, all identical strands are read simultaneously. Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced in a massively parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. In this step, the index 1 read primer is introduced and hybridized to the template. The read is generated similar to the first read. After completion of the index read, the read product is washed off and the 3' prime end of the template is deprotected. The template now folds over and binds the second oligo on the flow cell. Index 2 is read in the same manner as index 1. Index 2 read product is washed off at the completion of this step. Polymerases extend the second flow cell oligo, forming a double-stranded bridge. This double-stranded DNA is then linearized and the three prime ends blocked. The original forward strand is cleaved off and washed away, leaving the reverse strand. Read 2 begins with the introduction of the Read 2 sequencing primer. As with Read 1, the sequencing steps are repeated until the desired read length is achieved. The read 2 product is washed away. This entire process generates billions of reads, representing all the fragments. Sequences from pooled sample libraries are separated based on the unique indices introduced during the sample preparation. For each sample, reads with similar stretches of base calls are locally clustered. Forward and reverse reads are paired, creating contiguous sequences. 
these contiguous sequences are aligned back to the reference genome for variant identification. The paired end information is used to resolve ambiguous alignments. Okay, so this was about the full uh, technology in video. Uh, so exactly now, step by step, how it happens is you take an input DNA, whether it is DNA or cDNA. The amount could be from one nanogram to one microgram, depending on the library preparation kit you are using. Okay, and then what happens? This DNA is then uh, the library is then pushed through, through the flow cell. Flow cell is a part of glass slides. Uh, with lane of uh, oligos, which we have seen in the video, then based on the complementarity, your library they get and binds over there, and then a cluster is formed. So why we need a cluster is to form 500 or 1000 copies of the clonal amplified fragment. This is required because then the combined signal can be captured easily by camera. The signal from just one strand is very difficult to be captured by camera. Okay, so that is one reason why cluster generation is important. Once the cluster generation takes place, in each of these strands, a sequencing primer is bound. And then using reversible chain termination kind of a chemistry, your fluorescence level probes comes and binds. They are imaged. And then like this, data is generated. So this is the same clusters in different cycle. It is fluorescing in different wavelength. So a base calling is generated. So people who have already worked with next generation sequencing or who have like outsourced their samples, they must be receiving the primary data, which is called BCL files. So BCL files are actually these base calling files. Okay, this is the representation of the images. So unlike Sanger's, where uh, the data is captured in form of electrophorogram, here the data is electronically or digitally captured in form of basis. Okay, now how, this question happens: like, what is the role of index? What are the role of barcodes? And how and why sample can be mixed together? So this is a very typical example where if you can see, this is the P5 index, this is the P7 uh, or I5 index or I7 index. In these two samples, the index one is green, the index two are yellow. So they belong to the same sample. In these two samples, both the indexes are in different colors. So they belong to the different samples. While in these two cases, index one is same, but index two is different. So that means it belongs to different samples. So once the sequencing is done and you get a mixture of this data, so what the software initially does, which is a BCL to faster convert software, what it does is based on the indexes that you have, it bins the samples. So it will be bin into a different folder like this. Okay. And then depending on the number of samples you have actually pulled, you will get number of folders. So if you have pulled 384 samples in a run, like most people do for uh, next week when they are running COVID seek you will actually get 364 different folders, each folder representing data, giving a presentation of data of each sample. Okay, so this is how the index, the samples can be mixed together and then sorted on the basis of indexes or barcodes. So once this is done, you have various kinds of analysis uh, software available. So for example, BaseSpace is a cloud-based analysis software. In all of the desktop sequencer, or benchtop sequences, you actually have something which is called a local run manager, which can do certain analysis for you. In the next 2000, you have the on uh, system dragon software, which can do analysis for you. And then there's also offsite dragon. And then as I told before, there are various third party software analysis tools that can also be used. So the next part after this presentation is on Illumina next generation sequencing systems. So with Illumina, you get sequence. I don't know. Okay. Sorry, I'm not able to get it removed. So in Illumina, we have a sequencer for everyone's need. Okay. So we have, our smallest sequencer is iSeq, and our largest sequencer is NovoSeq, which can give you between 1.2 gigabases to six terabases of data in a single run. Okay, so this is a personal scale, very small uh, sequencing system, which is almost as big as a PCR machine. And then NovaSeq is a uh, your flow top sequencer, which is pretty heavy, around 600 kilos of the machine and very high throughput. So between these systems, we have 
various other systems we have the mini seek we have my seek we have next 550 then we have two next six uh, in this range like next 1000 and next 2000 so total one two three four five six seven and eight sequences so total eight sequences are there from the lowest throughput to highest throughput now as i told you the, uh, apart from nova seek all the other sequences are benchtop sequences so the benefit of using a benchtop sequencer is that they have a very fast turnaround, high flexibility, the simple workflow, and all the benchtop sequencers have integrated Illumina bioinformatics modules. So most of the very basic applications, the sequencers can analyze it. Okay. Now coming to iSeq, iSeq is the smallest sequencers. It gives you 1.2 gigabases of data for million reads and the read length is 150 PRN. It is very useful for, uh, it's known for its uh, simplified workflow, highly reliable. It's the cheapest next generation sequencer in Illumina stable. Very easy to set up. It doesn't have separate fluidics. So uh, maintaining the system is also very easy. And you know what? It is customer installable. So in most cases, customer installs it like they install PCR machines. You don't need a specialized engineer to come and install the system for you. Okay, it's pretty reliable. It can be used for small genome sequencing, 16S metagenomics kind of studies, and small 5, 10, 15 gene panels like HLA and BRCA. The second system from the stable is MiniSeq. The output increased jumps from actually 1.2 gigabases to 7.5 gigabases. The reads also jumps from 4 million to 25 million. And it comes with two different kinds of flow cell. One is high output flow cell, one is mid output flow cell. So in the high output flow cell, you get a data up to 7.5 gigabases. In mid output, you get 2.4. So depending on the application you are doing, depending on the number of samples you have, you can use either of the two flow cells, okay? Definitely the cost per sample of high output will be a little lower than mid output. But if you have less samples, you don't need to overkill your data running it at a, at a high output system. So again, uh, typically lower capital expenses than most of the other systems, simple onboard analysis, and it supports a breadth of targeted applications like small RNA, custom amplicon, enrichment based methods and resequencing. Okay. The third machine and the most popular machine in Illumina stable is MySeq. So the major advantage of MySeq is it is the only Illumina sequencer which can do a 600 base sequencing. So 300 plus 300 or 300 paired and reads. No other sequencer in Illumina can read this long, okay? And also it comes in eight kit versions. So there are eight different kind of uh, sequencing kits that are compatible with MySeq. You have the 300 cycle nano kit, the smallest one, which gives you 300 MB of data. And you have 600 cycle of V3 kit, which gives you 15 gigabases of data. So between 300 and 600 cycle V3 kit, you have eight different kind of kits for different kind of needs. This is the most uh, sought after platform for 16S metagenomics and amplicon sequencing because those are few applications which needs um, larger read lengths. Okay. And also it is the most sought after sequencer for uh, people who are my, uh, studying in microbiology because you can do a whole genome sequencing of microbiomes. You can do shotgun metagenomics. You can do a 16S RNA sequencing, and then definitely uh, all the virologists, they can also use to study virus. So it is also available in labs and used frequently by labs who are doing COVID-seq. Benefits are the only platform which can do 600 base pairs, so the longest read is available. It is scalable. There are eight different types of kits available which are compatible with it. And it's a very sim it has a very simple and easy workflow. It is also the only system currently which has a four die chemistry. Everything else except for ISIC has two die chemistry, uh, but that is for some other time. Uh, the next sequencing system is the next 550 system, which is a sort of a, uh, system by people who are doing COVID seek as well as uh, like assays like uh, cancer TSO 500 or NIPD. So the total output of uh, a next seek 550 jumps to 120 gigabases from 15 gigabases in uh, MySeq. So you also have a, a mid output kit, which gives you 20 gigabases. So it has a good range that it captures. The maximum reads are 400 uh, millions over here. 
it comes in again it comes into our pool mode so we say it, the big brother of uh, mini seek because mini seek also has a mid output and a high output uh, kind of sequencing kit and this also has the same so the mid output kit, kit can give you up to 40 gigabases of data while the high output can give you up to 120 gigabases of data and 400 million clusters it is a very good and sought after platform for doing small to medium genome sequencing for doing exome sequencing rna sequencing metagenomics single cell kind of a study and small to medium panels okay so in clinical uh, samples who are doing uh, a little bit of larger panels including clinical exomes and all next six are very suitable whether it is next six 550 or the next six thousand two thousand so coming to the second next six which is next six thousand two thousand it is one of the latest nexic available and the major feature is that it has an integrated dragon bio it platform so dragon has got guinea's record for being the fastest analysis uh, software that is there in the world also the flow cells are designed in a way that they are ultra high density so it gives you very high data in very small space and also the resolution is very uh, high it has a sing single integrated cartridge so like i you don't have to wash the system everything is built in it it washes itself and every time you change the cartridge the fluidic system changes so it's very very easy to use you don't even have to denature your library you just quantify it and put it so it will give you a uh, comparative like next 550 flow cell it's about 200 k clusters per millimeter square while in uh, next 2000 it is close to 5000 k so you can see the difference it is actually 25 folds so this is that much dense the clusters that are formed it's a pattern flow cell so the flow cell of next 2000 is much smaller than a next 550 but it gives you much more data than next 550 to be precise a p3 flow cell can give you three times the data okay so there are three different kind of flow cell and sequencing kit that are available with next 1000 and 2000 the smallest one which is called p1 gives you up to 30 gb of data the p2 gives you 120 gb which is similar to next 550 and the p3 can give you up to 360 gigabits of data okay so that makes this system uh, very good for uh, exomes rna uh, oncology panel enrichment and there are a few applications which will can later be actually uh, enabled on the system okay so it gives it much more strength than the nexic 550 or the nexic myseq and if you see the cost per sample the cost per gb also decreases as you go up from myseq to next seek. okay and then definitely next 2000 is the first system to integrate dragon by it platform fast accurate cost effective and there are various pipelines which are already enabled over there so once your run is completed once the data is generated it can automatically push it in the dragon and you can get the analyzed data in hand so that makes it very convenient and then our powerhouse from the stable of uh, illumina is nova seek scalable platform very flexible streamlined operations there are four various uh, four different kinds of flow cells that are available or sequencing kit sp which gives you 0.4 tb so uh, one interesting thing to note is that mysic gives you 600 uh, cycles it can give you up to 600 cycles of run the nova seek sp flow cell can give you 500 okay so after mysic it is not the mini seek or the next seek it is the nova seek which has the longest run and that too is enabled only in the sp flow cell so again if you have a large number of sickness metagenomics or amplicon kind of samples you can use nova seek okay you can actually do in upwards of 700 samples in a single run of sp flow cell when using nova seek that is the power then there is an s1 flow cell which gives you 500 uh, gb of data per flow cell s2 is 1.25 and then s4 three terabases of data and because you can run two flow cells at a time in one run you can get up to six terabases of data that is actually around 60 whole human genome at 30x coverage okay and the run time is two days so in two days you can actually sequence around 60 human genomes at a 30x coverage okay so these are some of the recommended uh, number of samples uh, using uh, different applications for human genome actually 24 to 30 you can use for exomes 250 to 384 depending on the kit you are using and for transcriptomes 200 to 250 based on the number of reads you want to look into so 
so this is the power and this is just one flow set so when you are using two flow sets you can just double the number okay that gives you an end result illumina has various kind of library prep so i am not touching more on the uh, various applications because my friend kara in the next presentation she will touch on the various applications uh, that can be done using the illumina ng system but broadly whatever application you are doing from whatever field it can be broadly classified in three ways like dna rna and then epigenetics so dna can be whole genome whether it is for a fungi it's for a virus or for humans it could be exomes or the or targeted panels okay so the main aim here is to discover variants then you have rna rna sequencing to monitor changes in uh, gene expression you can check for fusions you can check for uh, your various splice, uh, splice variants or transcripts and then epigenetics where you can identify the driver of gene regulations so we have various library prep solution these are few of them which are available from illumina on the onset you can order it at any time and there are many automation protocols which are automated by various other companies like agilent beckman appendroff hamilton pe and ticken so most of these library preps are also automated so you can find an automation partner by which you can automate these so these are the solutions that are available and that is the end of the presentation so thanks a lot for listening and ready to take questions um, thank you uh, raj shikhar for a wonderful uh, talk i think we have a couple of questions and uh, a few questions are really based out of uh, about uh, this uh, about exome sequencing how do you differentiate between whole genome sequencing and uh, and the whole exome sequencing and so that's that's some of the questions which are there so uh, maybe let's take a few questions over here so quality control parameters to check the ngs trend is successful or not yes so when you are uh, running actually that's a whole different presentations there are various parameters which get populated so one of the parameters is uh, your cluster passing filter and then your q30 score so q30 score is the most important parameter to check whether your ngs run is getting successful or not for each instrumentation for each flow cell there are separate uh, specifications like for example let's take for uh, uh, novaseq s4 flow cell 300 cycle the parameter is q30 should be more than 85% so if the q30 score you see for the run is 60% then definitely there is some problem with the run the other thing for non pattern flow cell to check is the cluster density cluster passing filter if your cluster density is higher than recommended and cluster passing filter is low that means there is an overclustering and overclustering will affect the quality so there are a lot of parameters uh, which you can check and the software that we use to check the parameter is sab okay so we can go in depth but uh, let us keep it for separate uh, please feel free to uh, shoot me a mail at my email id and we can discuss more about it the second is uh, how to go about validation study for new test on ngs kindly suggest for my six system okay so validation test let's say that means uh, you are trying to prepare a new panel for a certain disease so generally how panels are made is by going through literature for example let's say when a when someone made a panel for breast cancer they studied and they saw that the braca are the genes which are associated with breast cancer so they made a panel on that and then once you are doing a run the braca can be run on mice so once you are running it on braca on mice you check for the variants which are separate from the reference genome for the braca one and braca two and any mutation you can then again bioinformatically study whether the mutation is deleterious or not if it is deleterious it becomes a variant and with time you will know that what are the variants or what are the regions where if a variation is present it could lead to uh, your uh, disease or defect and then you can take it like that for any lab when you are testing a new panel you have to do a lot of in house validation and it can be easily done on a mysic instrument using the knowledge that is already present in literature uh, sorry uh, i can't answer the question on molecular weight of nanopore practicals because we are not uh, presenting nanopore over here uh, how to interpret interpret ngs data so that is for the bioinformatics uh, pipeline you can uh, always interpret in various way like i told you the qualitative and the quantitative information 
it can be interpreted in the way of variations mutations in epigenomes in the form of uh, copy number variations so there are multiple parameters by which uh, you can interpret the data the analysis can be done using uh, the available pipelines okay it could be available with illumina the modules can be present from illumina or third party software um, there's another question uh, there there are another question people. asking about nipt why this is specific to 550 why not for next seek 1000 and 2000 so uh, if devjan is there maybe she can answer yes. the question so uh, uh, sangeeta uh, i mean so nipt is a very strictly sop defined protocol so when illumina uh, developed this protocol um, it was i mean each step was defined very precisely it's an ivd uh, i mean it's almost equivalent to an ivd test even though in india the ruo format is available so that is the reason why it is not open to any other platform and very strictly done on the NextSeq 550. So when NextSeq 550 is standardized for any lab, we have to basically follow the protocol step by step and there aren't tweaks allowed, right? And even during the validation, one of the sample aliquots is sent to the uh, laboratory where NIPT was initially done and it was initially launched as a test send out. So because of that, it's not open to any other platform and uh, it is only validated on the next week 550. Okay, thanks Devjani. Uh, so the next question I think is from Swarupa is, uh, Sanger sequencing can be used to sequence smaller fragment whereas NGS can read longer fragment. Actually, not necessary in segment. Sanger sequencing also using PCR, you take out fragment. In NGS also using mechanical or enzymatic sharing, you break it into fragment. So the fragment sizes could can be similar for NGS and Sanger. It's, it has, it's not bigger or smaller. The only thing is in Sanger, in one uh, read or in one capillary, you can just read one fragment. While in NGS, you can read billions. That is why it is called massive parallel sequencing. Instead of just reading one fragment, you are reading tens of billions of fragments. So that is the difference. Limitation of MySeq. Of course, the major limitation of MySeq is throughput. You can do human exome or uh, even higher eukaryotic exomes or genomes using uh, MySeq. Okay, that is the major limitation. So if you have something of a high throughput experiment or a high throughput panel or even NIPTs and all, you will have to go for either a NextSeq or a NovaSeq. Okay. Uh, what is your take on sequencing low diversity libraries like PGS or Novasi? Uh, actually, for PGS, you don't need uh, Novasi. Novasi has a very high throughput instrument. You will be actually overkilling if you use Novasi for PGS. So that is why most companies suggest MySeq and NextSeq because the amount of data required is less. And also PGS like NIPT is a bit of controlled experiment. Uh, then is exomes, in exome sequencing is processed mRNA used as sample? No. In exome sequencing, uh, whole genome is used as input. In uh, RNA exome sequencing, your uh, total RNA is used as input. But in exome sequencing, it is the whole genome. You don't need mRNA, mature mRNA as a sample. Okay. There are probes, there are dates, which will bind to your exomes, pull it down and enrich it, which you can then make libraries and take it out. I'm interested in the cost involvement targeted NGS for tuberculosis. Maybe this, this is a question we can take offline. Uh, uh, Abhishek, please note it down. Uh, this is related to cost, so we can discuss it. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Sorry, uh, sorry, I can get your question. Can we enlarge sequence fragments of nanoparticles regarding the genome guideline sequencing for overkilling or controlling the exon RNA manipulation. Sorry, I don't get the question, but if you want to say whether you can uh, regulate the size of the clusters, you can't, that is already fixed by the machine. So if you are saying that if whether you can regulate the size of cluster so that you can have more cluster density, that is not possible. For every platform, it is fixed. You have a range and you have to uh, do it within that range. Okay, so these are the questions in the Q&A text. I see a few questions in the chat box also. 
So, Abhishek, would you like to take a few? Raj, Raj, I think uh, we have already done Yeah, so just the last now. question yes. from Dr. Anuradha. Can we include the promoter region uh, during exome sequencing? So, uh, currently, Dr. Anuradha, you can spike in the, uh, some of those regions. So, at the moment, the ready-made solutions, uh, I mean, not too many ready-made solutions um, offer this option, but you can spike in. Oh. Yeah, actually, Dr. Anuradha, sorry, Devjani, no solutions include the ready made solution, include promoter regions. There are a couple of solutions which does include the UTRs, but definitely not the promoter because there is a minimal promoter and there is an extended promoter. Okay. As Devjani said, if you have, if you want to make uh, a panel out of promoters, you'll, you can give us the coordinates and based on the coordinates, we can make a design which will include the promoter. But if you want to uh, capture the complete promoter of all the exons, all that 25, 30,000 exons, I think that will become very costly. The better solution will be to go for a whole genome sequencing. But definitely doable. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rashikar. Thanks, It Abhishek. was uh, very interactive. There are multiple questions and uh, there are still a few questions which are there. Uh, we would request you to please uh, send those uh, questions in email to Dr. Raj Shekhar so that you know we'll be able to help you out with any further queries or, uh, about uh, whatever platforms we have, what kind of applications we can support. Um, so moving towards our second talk for today. So for, for the for the second talk, we have with us Dr. Kara Lim. She is a, she is a senior infectious disease and microbiology segment manager at Illumina, and uh, she's uh, she specializes in uh, microbiology application, uh, wherein, uh, which is leveraging the power of next generation sequencing for for various uh, for various infectious disease application. She is deeply passionate about all the possibilities and advances in genomics. Uh, which can really bring in some changes in human health, particularly for infectious diseases. So over to you, Kara. Yep, thanks. And let me try to share my screen. All right. Thank you. Can you confirm that you are able to see screen. Yes, Fantastic. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Abhishek, for the very nice um, introduction. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. Um, thanks a lot, you know, like what uh, Dr. Rajshekla said. Thanks a lot for taking time out of your busy schedule to join in this, in this workshop. So um, as introduced, I'm Kara. I'm the Senior Infectious Disease and Microbiology Segment Manager from Illumina. And I'm based in Singapore, so it's about 8.30 p.m. here. Um, so my top title today is Empowering Microbiology Applications and Infectious Disease Testing with Next Generation Sequencing. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I just before I go start my presentation, I would like to say I'm really looking forward that this workshop, I think this workshop is so um, exciting and really looking forward that this workshop could soon be held physically at some point, right? I've missed visiting India a lot and there are, you know, and have the opportunities to interact with the audience, you know, before we go on the presentation. But I can already see a lot of exciting questions in the chat. So please keep them coming. So, you know, today, um, genomic and sequencing is almost a public password, right? Um, in Illumina, we used to joke that we went from no one understanding what is it that we do to today with our grandmas asking us about COVID variants, genomic surveillance at the dinner table. I'm sure you know this may be something that some of your, 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 your relatives, knowing that you are in the field of you know, microbiology, have that question for you too. So today in my talk, I aim to do three things for you, right? Hoping that after this talk, you know, I know that in this audience, there are quite a bit of researchers, there are some clinicians. So I try to cover both spectrum of this topic. So what I will try to do to you is that, first of all, I will share with you about Illumina, who we are and what is our mission. 
I would also like to introduce to you three key NGS methodologies for microbial genomics and infectious diseases and what are their values and where do you use them, right? When do you use them? Um, you know, and what are their pros and cons of these different um, uh, topics? And last but not least, I would also, I know have, we only have 30 minutes, to, 30 minutes together in this talk, so I definitely want to be able to show you where you can find information because from Illumina, as you can see that we have very dedicated teams catering for different segment activities, so we are always constantly developing new content um, to support, you know, curious researchers like you. So if you're interested to learn more, you know, there will be where you can find those information. So let's get started. So Illumina is a company that has been around for around 24 years. Um, our headquarters is in US San Diego. We are a global organization we, you know, with more than 7,800 employees supporting our global operation. What you will see in this slide is you know, where our regional offices are. So take, for example, in South Asia, including India, the regional offices, the regional office that are supporting this entire region is in Singapore, where we have a commercial office and we have a manufacturing site, right? Most of the products that the Indian customers receive, in fact, comes from the Singapore site. Um, you know, but also what you are seeing here are only our regional offices. In a lot of countries, including India, we have in-country presence working with our very dedicated channel partners like Primas, who serve as an extension of the Illumina team in order to be able to provide, you know, the suitable um, guidance and support with the suitable language to the local audience. We have one singular mission, which is to unlock the power of genome to improve human health. And we are fundamentally a, a technology company. You saw in the Raj slides, you know, the technical information around Illumina technology. What you are seeing here is basically the sequencing instruments that we have, you know, that will be able to cater to lab with different scale of sequencing requirement from low to high throughput as well as IBD instruments. And how can we improve health, human health with genomics, right? And obviously we, you know, we cater the, the, the sequencing to new technology to a wide range of um, markets, a wide range of segments. You, you know, you sometimes cannot believe the kind of segments that we are able to support. But specifically, if we are talking about human health, right, by providing the solution, right, um, to sequence genome in a high throughput and cost-effective manner, we are able to unlock various applications, you know, including in oncology, you know, supporting therapeutic selection and monitoring, enable a personalized treatment in genetic diseases, in genetic diseases, ending the diagnostic odyssey for rare diseases in NIPT, in which I saw a lot of questions where we can we are able to minimize the need for riskier invasive prenatal procedures and also. Sorry, um, can I check, sorry, can I check that I'm still on the presenter screen? Yes, Kara. Yep, thank you. So, and, and whereas in population genomics, where you may hear a lot of these projects coming up in your news feed, you know, improve and you know, those population skill genomics, including Genomics India, for example, aims to improve the quality and efficiency of healthcare system. And last but not least, the hot topic of these two years, right? SARS-CoV-2 surveillance. So Illumina technology has been in the forefront uh, of this pandemic since the beginning, starting from the discovery of the causative pathogen, right, which caused a pneumonia of unknown cause in China, and it is continued to be used throughout this pandemic. Today, um, NGS is routinely used globally to track new mutation and novel variants and monitoring their impact on transmission as well as on vaccine efficacy. As what you can see on this slide, you know, NGS occupies a very unique role in the COVID-19 response, right, monitoring the spread of COVID-19 transmission. And obviously, you know, in, in the day three of this workshop, you know, Dr. Asrida, for example, from, from, uh, from IGIB, definitely have a lot of very exciting 
um, you know, experience to share with you. I think personally, I'm very inspired by the depth and the amount, the scale of surveillance that India is able to achieve in a very short time. I can tell you working in the region, many countries look towards India as an inspiration that they are able to do similar uh, countries, national scale um, genomic surveillance in their country as well. So the stories of India has in fact inspired a lot of researchers. Right, so, but of course, as a lot of you may be asking, right, as the urgency of COVID-19 slowly recedes, now many public health scientists are looking beyond that, right, looking to make sure that we don't get caught by the same kind of surprise as COVID-19 again, right, so many public health scientists are now looking at leveraging genomics for the future pandemic preparedness as well as broader infectious disease surveillance. Here is not an exhaustive list of what kind of um, surveillance can be possible, right, so that includes one of a hot topic, you know, that everybody is very concerned about antimicrobial resistant and genomic surveillance. It's very important here because if you don't know what you are facing, what you are up against, you don't know how to manage that, right? Early detection of um, any diseases, endemic disease surveillance, zoonotic surveillance. And one of the most interesting um, applications which expanded a lot over the course of the pandemic, of course, is wastewater surveillance. And last but not least, you know, foodborne pathogen surveillance. And, you know, I think while we talk about these various infectious disease approach, you know, just one key word that is important for you to remember that is called the One Health Approach, where One Health Approach basically believes that, the, you know, in order for effective infectious disease surveillance, you have to cross the continuum of human, animal, and the environment. And NGS empowers this One Health Approach by being able, by being the technology that can be able to identify novel pathogens target pathogens, and then delivers high resolution pathogen characterization. And also because we're leveraging the very robust database that have been developed over the years to turn this genomic data into actionable insights, right? Looking at AMR, knowing that is this an AMR um, strain outbreak or not, take that as an example. And of course, um, NGS, as what you have heard from um, Raj, presentation is a very broad term, has a very broad application. So today we are only here to talk about microbiology and infectious diseases, right? So I want to be able to share with you that there are four key methodologies for infectious diseases and microbial genomics, each serve a unique purpose. And I trust that, you know, during the course of your research or your work, you may have come across them already. So today, hopefully after this talk, you can go out there and confidently tell your lab person, for example, that I today want to figure out how to do targeted sequencing, for example. So there are four key methodologies. Whole genome sequencing is the most basic one, right? It's basically sequencing DNA from a microbial isolate, right? Whereas metagenomics or metatranscriptomic is very, um, is a lot broader, right? It basically takes all of those nucleic acids, sequence everything, and then leverage bioinformatics to, to really you know, turn those action, that, that data into actionable insights and information, like whether what pathogen is it, what AMR. So it's a non, it's, it's a non-biased, unbiased method. And if we are trying to really figure out just one or two things, right? So I see that there is a question in the chat earlier. What can we use if we are trying to detect TB and COVID together in the same assay, for example, that would be targeted sequencing. So basically, you know what you're looking for. You design the probes or the primers to fish out those genetic material from your sample, and then you only sequence them and you only study those uh, materials. So I'll give you some examples in the subsequent slides. So this will basically be you have whole genome sequencing, you have method genomic, which is basically you sequence all the DNA materials, and you have meta transcriptomic where you sequence all of the RNA materials, which tells you a slightly different thing, including gene expression, RNA viruses, and et cetera. And then you have targeted sequencing, which covers two different approaches and enrichment or hybrid capture-based approach, as well as an amplicon approach. Don't worry about this. Um, I will cover this in the subsequent slide in, in more details. Right. Um, let's start with the broadest, the most unbiased one. Um, shotgun metagenomics. So I kind of want to kick you on this slide to really show you like the impact or that NGS can bring to the field of clinical microbiology. If you are a clinician or if you are a researcher, you may come across a term of unknown um, disease with unknown causes, or some clinician actually told me that they came across a situation where they have a patient, have 
a few patients, for example, coming in with symptoms of infections in pneumonia, but after going through several tests, are unable to identify a causative pathogens. Of course, most of the clinicians have to resort to start a broad spectrum treatment in order to manage the patient's symptoms, but it's I think these pose two significant problems, right? First of all, is that without, no, without being able to clearly understand what is the causative pathogen that is causing, that is making your patient ill, it actually reduces the amount of data point that we can gather when we are trying to understand the prevalence of a specific pathogen or if there is emergence of a novel pathogen in the community. Second of all, with this treat first test data sort of approach, it also doesn't help, you know, when when we sort of doesn't help with the exacerbation of the AMR situation. Of course, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm the clinicians are of course prudent in this approach, but what if there's a better way, right? What if there is a better way where you can be able to extract the nucleic acids from the clinical sample, sequence it, and from the genetic information, identify the causative pathogens, and also understand the drugs that the pathogen is resistant to, taking the guesswork out of the patient management all in less than two days. So what approach can make this vision a possibility? The answer is clinical metagenomics. And this is exactly, which is basically defined as the method which allows you to detect pathogens through their nucleic acid sequences without the need for a culture. And this is exactly the method that was used to detect and characterize SARS-CoV-2 in China where the clinicians are being baffled by, um, you know, several patients coming up with this pneumonia where they are unable to identify a causative pathogen. The goal of clinical metagenomics, as you can, last, can, you can see in this slide here, is basically to take all the nucleic acids from different kinds of clinical samples, take it through sequencing, and then eventually obtain a report of all of the pathogens that is present in these clinical sample, cross kingdom, right? Bacteria, fungi, you know, virus, etc. And then at the same time, determining what antibiotics the organisms are going to be resistant to, right? And of course, um, so, so, you know, and, and the benefit of this approach is that it is unbiased and it does have a benefit that it is one assay that is applicable to various sample types. Of course, I have to be um, you know, careful with this information here because these different sample types do require different sort of upstream processing method, which is an area of active research in the clinical metagenomics community. So this is a very busy slide, but it highlights the advantages of shotgun metagenomics, right? It's a culture-independent methodology. It allows a hypothesis-free testing. Right? It provides you the possibility of doing one test multi-kingdom analysis. Um, it also add, provides additional benefits. Right? It allows you to be able to um, look in, you know, infer if you are in a research space, it allows you to look into not just the pathogen identification, but also take the genetic materials and study the, the metabolic pathway of the pathogen or the, the microbe that, that is present in that samples. And of course, you know, I'm sure you are not foreign to the to the terms of uh, microbiome, which I'll touch on in the subsequent slide. But for clinical metagenomics, again, right, it is a vision for many, many um, clinical microbiologists to be able to get there one day. This is an area with very active research, you know, further accelerated by the pandemic, realizing the, the importance of such a method in ensuring we don't miss any important novel pathogens that have pandemic potential again. So we realize that there are various components that needs to be in place. And being a technology company, we can't do it all. So in fact, last year, we announced a partnership with a metagenomics company called ID by DNA, which helps to even build up the portfolio of the um, infectious disease um, testing solutions that we can offer to clinical microbiologists today. And you know, where we eventually want to get to is that you are able to run any samples through um, sequencing through the clinical metagenomics method and come up with these very easily interpretable report where you can see what pathogen is there, use the genomic equivalent to understand the cluster, the, the colony destiny of uh, density of these pathogens, understand what genetic markers indicates what kind of resistance is predicted for this pathogen. I think this is already possible to there for certain clinical sample types, but this is eventually the vision we want to get to for various different types of infectious um, diseases. 
And you know, one of, one of the key benefits here, right? Um, most of you who are already in the clinical microbiology space is not foreign to this concept where you have to go through several layers of tests sometimes to arrive at a causative pathogen analysis. But one of the possibility of going through a clinical metagenomics is what Raj kind of mentioned when he was illustrating the workflow is that clinical metagenomics allow you a possibility to take a sample, run it through sequencing and obtain both of these information, the final pathogen ID and um, as well as the antibiotic resistance um, in, in less than two days or e even in one day, depending on the amount of samples that you're sequencing. Last but not least, shotgun metagenomics is also a very important methodology that is pushing the boundary of microbiology research in the space of our second um, genome, right? Um, this, which is our microbiome, right? That the, the, the one organism, the, the multiple organism that actually has bigger genome size than human. So, you know, there are various space that is being, uh, various microbiome space that is being researched today, right? I, I'm sure a lot of you heard about 16S metagenomics, but this methodology, like shotgun metagenomics, is really the key methodology that you want to use today for microbiome because there are so many knowledge gaps that can be filled with these methods, including, you know, active research in potential disease associations, right? As well as, you know, most interesting is microbiome-based therapeutics. If you're able to understand the disease association, you are also able to either understand the microbial biomarker that can potentially serve as a therapeutics. Right, um, so moving from the broad range to a slightly narrower range, which is targeted sequencing. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are two approaches to targeted sequencing, the Amplicon approach and the, the hybrid capture approach, right? This slide is a little bit more technical, but I kind of want to uh, kind of want to show you the difference between two different approaches. Amplicon approach is probably something that a lot of you are more familiar with. It's basically uh, a PCR-based um, approach. You PCR your um, you PCR the target regions out and then you sequence them. And so it is ideal for a smaller number of markers, one to 100, which is, for example, in the context of SARS-CoV-2 is a perfect fit because it's a 30 kb genome, which is really small and relatively easy to, to, to PCR out, right? It is also lower cost in terms of the assay. The primer, however, the primer design, however, is a lot more complex and you may, a lot of you may have already heard about the B3, B4, B4.1 primers with um, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. The reason is really because Amplicon-based approach is very sensitive to the genetic variants at the primer target region. However, it, it, the advantage of it is it, it is a much more simpler workflow and, um, and, how, like, and it's a lot more simpler workflow, which is preferred when you have to do you know, a same sort of target for a, a very large throughput type of um, um, work. On the other spectrum is the hybrid capture approach, which is where I personally see that it's going to really push the frontier in terms of clinical metagenomics and clinical microbiology workflow, as well as research. And you know, the reason why is that it, this, as you can see, the contrast here is that this approach is ideal for even a very large number of probes, right? However, the challenge is that it is a higher cost than Epicon. However, it has the advantage that it's a lot easier to design the probes, right? And it's very easy for you to add in new probes. The workflow is a lot more complex than Amplicon, but the biggest advantage that this methodology offers is that it is a lot more robust to pathogen evolution, right? It is a lot more tolerant to genetic variation at the, tar at the probe target region. And even so, if I take the example of SARS-CoV-2, with an Amplicon approach, and in throughout the course of the pandemic, we have to update the Amplicon primers for at least three times, two to three times already, in order to ensure that we are able to to capture the full genome of these, all these different evolving variants. However, we have hybrid capture approach at the very early stage of pandemic, we launched a panel called the RBOP, Respiratory Virus Oligo Panel. And this same panel hasn't been changed at all. And a lot of some of our researchers who are using this panel actually tell us that they were able to consistently get very high quality genome coverage throughout the course of the pandemic, throughout these evolving variants, because you know, the hybrid capture approach is really robust against these mutations. So as I mentioned earlier, the first example that I want to share with you for this Amplicon-based approach is um, Illumina COVID-6. I think Raj mentioned it a, a few times in, in, his, 
um, talk, right? So it's basically an amplicon based method, right? That contains 98 amplicons cover the full genome of SARS CoV 2. And we have two S2 kit types that allows you to cost effectively sequence whether you have a low triple, which is you know, less than 96 samples, all the way to very high triple if you need to catch sequence, you know, 3072 samples in 36 hours. And that is one of the approaches that is very, um, that is used widely in. Um, um, in the INSECOP surveillance work. And the main aim of this is that, in fact, this COVID sig what a lot of people may, um, you know, some of you may not know in this chat, is that COVID sig is, in fact, the first NGS assay that received US FDA, EUA use approval for testing. But however, I think over the course of the pandemic, the, the need for high throughput genomic surveillance become more and more important. And that assay is now having a research use only option for surveillance use. But in Japan, for example, the EUA version is still widely used um, to, um, to look at clinical samples. And this app is powered. And I think most one of the things that a lot of you who are new to NGS are just dabbling in NGS. The biggest question that I also see some in the chat is that what about bioinformatics? How difficult it is to do bioinformatics. So I want to share with you that in Illumina, it's really where we are. You know, it's it's an area that we actively work on, right? We receive a lot of feedback from 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 all of you that you said you know bioinformatics is one of the barrier um, for NGS adoption. So we're continuously trying to innovate in this space. So take SARS-CoV-2 surveillance as an example. We have a very user friendly Dragon COVID lineage app that you can just run your sequencing and then. Um, you know, input the sequences that you have gotten from the sequencer into this app, and you will be able to generate a report like that where you are able to have, you know, um, you know the, the, the lineage information assigned, um, uh, the, the QC being done and reported to you, as well as a percentage of genome coverage cover, you can be able to look at each individual amplicons and understand the changes there. So it really takes the manual work of you know, doing a command line out and really allow you to focus on understanding the data, interpreting the data, and focus on your microbial research. Of course, there is still a long way to go. There are a lot of applications to cover. We are trying our best to prioritize, but you know, and, and also as you know, there are because of so many researchers having the experience, abundant experience working with Illumina Instrument, there are a lot of resources out there where the researchers publish open source tools to be used with Illumina data or you even have commercial companies that develop very, very user-friendly tools, compatible and validated for Illumina data. So I think that is an advantage, um, of one of the advantages that I see for um, Illumina technology as well. The second thing that I kind of want to bring you to is really bringing you to look at the, con the, the, the application of a hybrid capture-based um, targeted sequencing uh, method. Let's talk about pneumonia. And pneumonia is really a clinical and a diagnostic challenge, right? Because in pneumonia, there are various etiological agents or the causative pathogen that creates overlapping clinical syndromes. You know, a lot of times the public health is just categorized as acute respiratory infection. Um, there are many microorganisms that can cause pneumonia. Some of them may just appear to be common colonizer of the respiratory tract. Conventional testing can be slow and require multiple diagnostic tests in order to come to a comprehensive detection and evaluation. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, antibiotic is an increasing challenge. And therefore, accurate pathogen identification and treatment has become increasingly important. Um, so if you look at this chart, right, what you see here is that a lot of times a respiratory infection or a pneumonia may not be caused by one single etiological agent. Co-infection is a common challenge, even in SARS in COVID-19. Um, it is found that there are various um, co-infection that occurs in a lot of the samples, which further complicates the management. And of course, that depends on the immune um, system of the patient as well. So in this context, right, you can imagine that if you have a panel that covers all of the common and known respiratory infectious agents, how much of time that it would save for clinicians in order if you can be able to just screen through this very broad range of panel and come to a conclusion that yes, I have a pathogen or no, I don't have a detection, I need to do shotgun metagenomics immediately. Take that as an example. And you can imagine this will really have the potential to transform clinical microbiology approach and practices. 
So what is our initiative on this to approach this particular challenge? We work again with the ID by DNA to have a hybrid capture-based panel called the Respiratory Pathogen ID AMR panel. So in contrast to the COVID-6 panel that you saw in the earlier slides, which covers only SARS-CoV-2 genome in one panel, RPIP, because it's a hybrid capture-based method, you are able to include targets for more than 280 pathogens across kingdoms, bacteria, viruses, fungi. And on top of that, we can also have probes that capture more than 1,200 antimicrobial alleles, which allows you to detect resistance to more than 16 antibiotic classes. And that is on top of the uh, controls that we have in there in order to ensure, you know, um, uh, uh, positive, uh, as a positive control. In addition to that, right, we are also able for the smaller viruses, take SARS-CoV-2 and flu viruses as an example, we know that these two viruses are key public health concerns. So you are, we are also able to include probes which can be able to sequence the full genome of these two pathogens as well. And because you know, we are really focusing on TB and COVID-19, so I really want to pull out one example of how this can be done, right? So take TB as an example, what this broad range of panel can do while you look at all these different respiratory pathogens. So the, the targets that is within this panel allows you to not only look at a broad range of respiratory pathogens sequence the SARS-CoV-2 virus if it is in the sample, it will also allow you the additional ability, for example, to differentiate between closely related mycobacteria and mycobacterial complex, and also report the resistance to the first and second line entity drugs. And you know, this is an example of how many samples you can put in one, one run, as well as the amount of sequencing time that you need. So if, if you look at the option number two, three, four, those are, the, um, those are the usual specs that you can run on our usual flow cells. You can see that you, you can sequence up from the range of 25 up to 384 samples in one run. But on the far left, you will see mini seq one by 100 cycles with five hours being highlighted in red. So this is also an innovation that we just launched last year um, in order to um, accelerate the amount of time, turnaround time for these clinical, uh, sort for these RPIP detection methods where you can run it on a rapid full cell and uh, obtain the sequencing of 20 samples in five hours. So of course, back again to analysis, how difficult is it to analysis? So the reason why we partner with ID by DNA is to leverage their expertise in their x database. And this is the report that you will be able to get from the, R the included RPIP analysis solution um, um, you know, on the cloud-based um, base -based sequence hub, which Raj talked about earlier. So you'll be able to detect the pathogens as well as what you can see lower here, the AMR markers and the associated microorganisms detected. So in short, in summary, what I did, what I just told you, there are various workflows that you can use, take for example, to specifically study respiratory infections, right? There is the shotgun metagenomics workflow, which I mentioned is an unbiased approach, right? We also have several analysis tools, which allows you to look into um, user-friendly analysis to look into microbiome research, or if you are trying to um, analyze a certain samples, but of course, this method is more suitable for higher triple because you do require more depth because you are really you know, sequencing everything in there at certain times, the microbial load may be too low for you to detect. So this is really being, you know, um, there, are, there are a lot of institutes we may need to prioritize sample for this approach. And then you have the targeted sequencing approach take, for example, in the enrichment base, we have the RBOP, we have RPIP, whereas in the Amplicon based approach, you have COVID-19. All right, so coming to the last methodology, whole genome sequencing, right? Um, it is such, you know, it is one of the most fundamental um, uh, microbial genomics methodology. Um, so usually I like to start with this layer, look at this, this is what a lot of microbiologists are very comfortable with. You come to a single isolate, and then you ask the question, what is it, right? Has it been seen before? Is it new? How can we find it? Is it an outbreak? Is this sample related to another sample? Should we be concerned? Right, and this is what this image, what this image shows you, is the different methodology that a, a conventional microbiology lab needs to go through in order to arrive at these answers. So the challenge here is that this is long turnaround time. It provides limited information and occasionally provides you with confusing results. So what whole genome sequencing aims to achieve is really one data that provides you with multiple answers. On the left hand side here, you see, you know. Um, 
you know, samples going through media for culture and arrive at the state where you, set, you uh, obtain the single isolate. What you can do next is that basically run it through sequencing and then assemble the genome. And then you take that sequences, you query the different various database that is available, and you are able to get several information that include species, relatedness, what is the resistance uh, markers present within this genome, what are the virulence factors within this genome, as well as you can share the same genome information into a national or international database and you allow yourself to compare your genome with the microbial genomes all over the world. One of the applications of how this can be done is that there is one, um, um, one um, application in US, for example, called the Genome Tracker, where different public health labs submit their genome isolates into this database and they can be able to quickly see, oh, the pathogen that is making my patient sick actually comes from these particular letters that the FDA detected at that particular farm. So now I know what is causing the, this patient sick and I realize that there is a cluster of patient that is being made sick by these contaminated letters. I should really go and sue this company or the public health state should be able to do something either to stop the, the, sell, the, the, the sale of these particular letters from this particular source in order to stop the infection from spreading. So this is one of the benefits where if you have an easily um, sort of inter sort of um, shared data where it's interoperable, it, there is a lot of potential that this can unlock. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, most interesting, you know, is that what I mentioned earlier, that like WGNS information really provide the guidance or relatedness by looking at the mutation that is accumulated over generations. So in public health, you would actually notice today, there are several um, sectors that is already you know, realizing the importance of whole genome sequencing. So take what I just mentioned earlier, um, food safety, where you know, World Health Organization published a guideline a few years ago to talk about whole genome sequencing for um, foodborne disease surveillance. And then, you know, um, FAO, as well as the PulseNet International um, are, you know, transforming the use of Pulse, uh, the PFGE into whole genome sequencing because the whole genome sequencing provides a lot more robust information and it's easier to collaborate between different labs. Similarly, with infectious diseases, you know, MTB is definitely a huge topic. Tomorrow is the World TB Day. Um, two, two to three years ago, WHO published this, which really opens up a lot of, uh, it really allows the awareness for a lot of scientists, you know, to look into the, the, the amount of information that you can get from NGS for MTB. And similarly, you know, the, the Stop TB Partnership also sees the value of whole genome sequencing for TB control. Last but not least, there is all, you know, if you are interested in the topic of antimicrobial resistance, WHO have these very, ex, um, very comprehensive reports that talks about how, where um, the, the state of the use of whole genome sequencing for surveillance of antimicrobial diseases. And if I just want to bring it back to one, Topic, right? There are so many different applications that whole genome sequencing can be applied into, right? And TB surveillance is one of it. I'm sure that there will be topics that cover this tomorrow. But I just want to talk about, you know, what, what, what about in the healthcare organization? Where do whole genome sequencing plays a role? And this is a like HAI, healthcare associated infection, is a topic that raised, like, is uh, the awareness for this topic or is, has been shot in the spotlight during the course of the pandemic with people realizing that you know, poor clinical practices do increase the risk of healthcare workers as well as the patients exposing them to um, healthcare associated infection. As, as you can see in this slide that it is, um, you know, it is a, a, a particular challenge that, you know, have tremendous implications in terms of associated mortality, morbidity, patient outcomes, increased cost of treatments, as well as social impact. But of course, I know that this is already a focus area in India, which is really amazing that, you know, there is so much initiative that is already put into it with the network of hospitals running a HAI surveillance network. So this is some of the financial impact of HAIs, but just in the interest of time, I will skip this. But I just want to bring to you, just to high push the topic of whole genome sequencing a bit more, right? What do you have learned about whole genome sequencing earlier, the value that it brings Take HAI as an example, whole genome sequencing has the potential to serve as one single assay that will be able to do the microbial surveillance, knowing what kind of pathogen is, is causing HAIs in the healthcare setting, as well as understanding if these different patients that is affected by HAI, are they a part of an outbreak and if there is certain outbreak management that needs to be done. Um, 
Of course, it's uh, in terms of holding of sequencing, it is it is more cost effective compared to various multiple existing workflow that is being used. It allows shorter time to identify outbreak clusters and provide better resolution to go in or out of the cases to an outbreak. So in summary, what I've told you today is that there are three key methodologies for, any, for infectious diseases and microbial genomics, clinical metagenomics, targeted sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. Currently, NGS is an important tool for microbiology research and infectious disease surveillance. It will continue to play a role beyond COVID, but at the moment, NGS occupies a unique role in COVID-19 pandemic response. And where are we going next? Where are we going next is really to expand the use of NGS in clinical microbiology. So if you're interested to learn more, as I mentioned earlier, we continue to develop technical resources for the space of infectious disease and microbiology. You can get started with, on the left, a, a, a new user guide to NGS covers very comprehensive information about the technology, library prep methodologies. And then we also have a dedicated methods guide for microbiology. Um, recently, we published two latest tech note to cover the topic of you know, guidelines of detecting Omicron using the COVID-19 essay, as well as you know, one of the hot topic in the surveillance space today, which is wastewater sequencing. We also recently published a tech note on surveillance of infectious disease through wastewater sequencing. We have various webinars. If you Google Illumina webinar archive and select your area of interest and my as microbial genomics, you will be able to produce all of these content for free. The first one, of course, I want to highlight that last year we did a very amazing um, webinar with Dr. Shrida um, talking about the experience of SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance in India, which have inspired a lot of researchers. And I also, also want to mention that tomorrow is World TV Day, and we have the honor of working with one of, the, uh, one of my panelists in this group here, Dr. Camilla, on a very comprehensive and informative webinar. I know that Dr. Camilla is going to be on a panel tomorrow if you're interested to know, you know the, ex the amount of knowledge and value she, she, she already has. You know, please feel free to check out this webinar. You can scan this QR code or I will drop the link to this, um, to this destination page in the chat as well. And in addition to that, with the same destination page, you will be able to access these um, infographic which you develop in collaboration with Nature Editorial in order to help um, the researchers provide the visuals to quickly understand the impact of drug-resistant TB as well as the insights you can obtain through NGS for um, drug-resistant TB. Last but not least, thank you very much uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thanks, Kara, for a very insightful talk. Um, so I think there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Will you take those questions? Uh, just give me a minute. So it's starting from Jigdish Parihar. Or should you want me to have a few uh, questions for you? Shortly now let me try to stop sharing first. All right. Okay, I can see the screen a bit better. And I'm going to just pop the um, destination page into the chat, and then we can start to look to questions. Hmm. All right. Uh, yes, bring me the questions. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't able to check the chat earlier. So is this in Q&A? Right. All right. Uh, so, okay, so starting from Jackfish, you mentioned what is the data size for TB and OB samples in GB that is good for further analysis? Um, on top of my head, I think Raj would probably be better at calculating this GP for information for me. But basically, I think you want to, so it depends on the applications that you are going for. But if I take whole genome sequencing as an example, right, for TB generally, we try to aim for 30x coverage and above. And TB is obviously quite a large genome that is about um, 4MB plus. Whereas for COB, SARS-CoV-2 is about 30 KB and generally for um, viruses, right? Because you are trying to understand both um, a consensus level variants as well as you are trying to track a subpopulation variant, we usually recommend to go for, if I'm not mistaken, 100 to 1,000 sort of coverage. But of course, usually with um, current sequencing, we achieve about, we try to aim for about 500 KB bits per sample uh, for SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, what do you think those who has TB infection has less chances for COVID? I don't think I'm the best person to understand, answer this. I think the clinicians in the um, panel tomorrow will definitely be more qualified. You know, please feel free to post this chat. But I, what I know is that, you know, um, you know, co-infection is 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 quite an issue, even with you know various sort of respiratory infection um, um, cases. But I don't have the statistics between TB and SARS-CoV-2, unfortunately. Um, I, I see Dr. Camilla on the call. I wonder if she wants to chip in with this answer. Um, I see that Dr. Jayanti asked the question, can we have a workflow for flu and SARS-CoV-2 virus identification possible? Yes, so that is already possible today. So we have two panels. One is called Respiratory Virus Oligo Panel. Um, that basically covers more than 42 respiratory viruses of public health concern. And that, of course, includes flu as well as SARS-CoV-2. And with that panel, you are not only able to detect, but you are also able to sequence the full genome of these two viruses if they are present in the sample. And it also comes with a very user-friendly um, data analysis tool as well. Um, please feel free to um, reach out. Maybe Dr. Abhishek can follow up to share information about RVOP. Uh, Dr. Kanchan asked the question, can exemplify for TB drug resistance if results from direct clinical extra pulmonary centers? Um, okay, I'm going to interpret the question as whether or not extra pulmonary samples is a sample type that is suitable for um, detection of drug resistance through an AGS. I know that what I understood is that extra pulmonary sample types is still quite a challenging sample type. I think it is still an area with active research. Most of the samples today that is being used through NGS workflow are sputum samples. Um, Abhishek, do you want to add any points on that? Um, I think uh, we would be having a, a session or uh, talk with Dr. Camilla. That time, this kind of questions would be probably answered through her talk. So I think uh, Dr. Kanchan, please be with us uh, tomorrow. And I think you will be able to get all, your, all these questions answered. I also strongly recommend you to check out Dr. Camilla's webinar where she touched on this um, topic on extra pulmonary samples as well. Very excellently, if I may add. Um, how will it differentiate between colonizer and actual infection? That is a really good question, right? So um, I think this comes back to the point about a very high quality database. Um, so the database and, you know, a very, it's the reason why we partner with ID by DNA because they have very extensive research in the space of respiratory infection and therefore they curate they are um, database of the Explify platform in a way where they are able to um, have the nuances when they are analyzing the data. So it's called a syndromic type of analysis where they run the sample through and the, the software analysis, the analysis software adds in the logic that this is a respiratory infection samples. And you know what I understood is that the colonizers could be reported, but it will be able to mark as whether or not this is a high, like uh, this is a high importance or high priority pathogen or not, or it's a low pathogen priority, which most likely indicate that it is just a colonizer. Want to know about the novel strain discovery pipeline for COVID? That's a very, very good question. So when it comes to novel strain discovery, right? You mean novel strain discovery? So I'm, I'm so I'm going to answer these questions in two parts, right? First of all, how does novel pathogen discovery gets done? And second of all, is with the new lineage of SARS-CoV-2, how does it get detected? So the first one with um, novel pathogens. So take for example, how was the SARS-CoV-2 detection happen? How did the SARS-CoV-2 detection happen in China? So it start, started with the workflow of uh, clinical metagenomics and uh, clinical, sorry, short guy metagenomics, right, where you sequence everything. And then um, when, they, when they sort of unable to identify a likely causative pathogens, they were able to assemble 
um, the genetic materials and identify something that resembles coronavirus but doesn't fully map to SARS-CoV-2 or any pre-existing coronavirus. So that started the hypothesis that, hey, this may be a novel pathogen and therefore further genomic assembly is done and that, that assembly forms the current, the today, um, you know, uh, original reference genome of SARS-CoV-2. So that, um, I would say, novel pathogen discovery requires a lot more work. Another approach that I, I see some of the zoonotic pathogens, um, the zoonotic disease surveillance experts do, is that because they often see novel pathogens. In fact, even in bacteria, if you, and that's one of the, one of the benefit of genomics today. Is, in fact, genomics is, is, is revolutionizing how people look at taxonomic classification of bacteria, right? So bacteria, viruses, when you assemble the genome and you map it against the existing database, which is really, really wide, and you can't find a match or you see that, hey, you know, the, the, the genomic similarity is quite different, uh, is quite huge in terms of the differences, that always prompted the hypothesis that, hey, should I look into more of this? And for bacteria, for example, you are able to take the conserved genome um, and then, you know, um, analyze it against existing database and identify if you actually have a novel bacteria on hand. So I think during my research, I did, you know, one of my lab mates did found one and we were, you know, we did further analysis and we were able to characterize it as a novel pathogen. And then you can kind of have fun kind of naming that pathogen and then that bacteria, sorry. And then while for um, SARS-CoV-2, sorry. So then I'm moving on to the topic about novel lineage uh, characterization. Um, so no, novel lineage characterization, you basically, you know, running through, so when you see, um, it's basically, um, similarly, take the SARS-CoV-2 sequence map against existing database and see if, it's a, if the variant doesn't match the current classification, that's where you know you may have a novel lineage on your hand and then, you know, the next train, for example, helps to assign a, a new lineage classification. Um, Kara, yes. I just want to yes. add here something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Mr. Arpanbhat, I think we have a, a dedicated a day for uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance at the third day. There, you would also come to know about uh, the discovery pipeline for the novel strains. And you'll also get to know the overview of the entire uh, mm -hmm. genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 and the insight from India, Indian setting as well. So, yeah. Be, yeah, so just be with us for the third day. Uh, for, for this session also, where Dr. Mr. Shivaji also will talk about uh, overview of COVID-19. Yeah. I see one last question here about how effective is metagenomics in drug-resistant TB. Um, I would say that with drug-resistant TB, because as I mentioned earlier, shotgun metagenomics, I feel it's most valuable because after all, at the moment, because of its sensitivity, because when you sequence shotgun metagenomics, right, you are actually sequenced not just the microbial um, genetic materials, you are also sequenced the human cells, you are sequenced various other sort of normal flora within the samples. I think when the early stage of pandemic, when people are using shotgun metagenomics method to sequence, sorry, shotgun method transcriptomic method to sequence SARS-CoV-2, I think the SARS-CoV-2 represent less than 0.1% of the total genetic materials that they capture. So you can imagine that in order to capture a microbe, a, a, a pathogen or, a, or within that sample text that is of your target pathogens, you actually require a lot of reads. I think at the minimum for respiratory samples, we recommend 10 million reads. Certain, certain researchers even go all the way to 20 million reads. And so with that, if you are trying to capture the full genome, and with that, you also have to pose a risk if your sample quality is not very good, your viral load is not very high, for example, you may potentially not be able to capture the full genomic information. So what I mentioned earlier, for example, if you know very clearly that you are not looking for a novel pathogen, but you are looking for drug you are looking for TB and you are looking to correct the rise the drug resistance, it depends on your research objective. If your research objective is to um, it last elucidate right the, the phenotypic the, the drug resistance and identify any novel mechanism or doing surveillance of drug resistance then you should go for whole genome sequencing where you culture tb and then you sequence it but if your aim is only to detect the known profile or the known uh, mutations which uh, indicate uh, certain resistance to particular anti-tb drugs then you should go for the targeted sequencing methods whether by epicon based method or enrichment basement.
Um, of course, you know, I think from Dr. Camilla's web webinar, you also hear that. And I think I share the same sort of a dream where one day we can be able to take from the, the sputum samples directly sequence the whole genome of TB from the sputum sample so that we are able to do two things at once, right? Detect the drug resistance profile as well as capture the whole genome which will contribute into expanding the database and our understanding of the resistance mechanism of TB as well as do the genomic surveillance. I think, you know, I think Dr. Camilla and the team did a very innovative approach using enrichment. Um, it is still, um, it is a great, it is a great approach, but it cannot, I think it is still at today, not able to sort of scale up to a very large number of samples, but you know, that is also one option. I hope that answers the question. I don't see any question. I don't know if I missed any. So I think, um, Kara, I think uh, we'll, we have a few more questions, but those are, those are pertaining towards uh, specifically for TB. So let's uh, reserve them for tomorrow. Yes. And uh, I, I really appreciate all the participants for shooting out very interesting questions. There are a few questions which are, we are not able to take them up now because of the shortage of time, but uh, we'll surely try to respond to you separately later on. And uh, also re uh, request all of you to please join us back tomorrow for the, for, 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 uh, for the TV session. Thank you so much, Kara, for, for a wonderful talk. And Have a great evening, everyone. Bye. And we would be sharing a, a feedback link uh, here. And please do give us uh, the uh, feedback. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. See you all tomorrow.